Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Lester. Um, I work as a software engineer at uh, Yahoo. Uh, previously Verizon Media, previously Oath, uh, previously uh, Yahoo. I think this is my uh, third time at the Berlin Buzzwords. I've had the same job, but I've represented different companies. But uh, anyway, uh, I, at Yahoo, I work for the Vespa team, uh, developing the Vespa platform out of Trondheim, Norway. And uh, there I work primarily with um, uh, machine learning solutions, um, being able to run inference uh, on uh, machine learning models, evaluate them, primarily in the context of search and recommendation and so on, uh, on the Vespa platform. Um, but I'm not going to talk too much about that today. Uh, today I'm going to talk about hybrid search. And um, for those of you that caught uh, Joe Christian's uh, talk earlier today about semantic uh, search, uh, Joe Christian is a, a colleague of mine, uh, there was a, a question about how, how do we define hybrid search. And uh, the way that I am going to define hybrid search, at least initially in this talk, uh, is the combination of traditional keyword term-based search, like BM25 and so on, with the kind of newer, cooler, uh, dense representation, transformer-based, BERT-based search, and so on. How do we kind of combine those things to maybe kind of get something out of them that is more than each of them individually? So we're going to see how we do that a little bit later. <coughs> but first of all, a little bit about Vespa, the team, team that I work on. Uh, so Vespa is uh, what we call the open source platform for low latency computations over large evolving data. Uh, it's a platform that we've been developing over many, many years, uh, primarily inside of Yahoo, uh, but we open sourced this a few years ago. Uh, and today, it's internally in, in uh, Yahoo, it's, it's very popular. It's running hundreds of different applications, uh, hundreds of thousands of queries every second, uh, hundreds, of thousands, hundreds of millions of unique users uh, every month. Um, and Vespa has, as it has been developed over many, many years, is a very kind of big and robust set of features, uh, like the ability to um, uh, compute using native tensors as first-class citizens, built-in support for many different types of machine learning solutions. You can string them together and so on, which is kind of a unique feature. Um, but today, in the context of hybrid search, what we're going to be looking at a little bit is uh, the capability of doing search, like keyword-based search, uh, structured search, and combining that with, uh, with vector search. And uh, we think, at least, that Vespa is kind of like in a unique position to, to capitalize on those two uh, different approaches. <coughs> um, yeah. Uh, at Yahoo, it's running a lot of different uh, applications and so on. It's been very uh, big use. And we have a hosted solution inside of Yahoo, uh, running 25 billion real-time queries a day, uh, triple that number of updates and so on. And we've recently opened up uh, a cloud offering uh, so we can use the, the competence that we've gained in running this internally, also for external customers as well. But I'm not going to talk too much about that. So, um, getting to the problem at hand, uh, today we'll talk pretty much about search. And uh, to kind of define the problem a little bit, for those not too familiar with it, uh, we have this set of content that we want to search within. Content can be anything, really. Uh, it can be text, it can be images, uh, video, user profiles, um, uh, purchase sequences, whatever you want to do. But yeah, it's some sort of content that you have. Um, but most of it, the talk today will be about text. And whenever you have some sort of uh, documents and so on, representing the text, we have some way of, we need some way of representing it. Um, and then after we have this representation, we need some way of storing it uh, in some system, some database or so on. Uh, and the task really is to have some sort of query that comes in, and we need to represent that in some way that's compatible with the documents, and then do a search or do like a query uh, within the system, and uh, retrieve uh, the most relevant documents for that query. Uh, typically, this is like a multi-stage process where first we find all the documents that are in some way uh, relevant, and then we score them according to some sort of uh, uh, scoring function, and, and thus ordering all the, uh, the documents that we have, and then returning the top uh, K of them. And that's the kind of general uh, problem that we have for search. <clears throat> And when it comes to text, we've had this solution for a long time. We call this term-based or sparse retrieval. 
and uh, we have these documents, and we represent them using uh, some sort of bag of word representation. And bag of words uh, just means that we represent them, we don't really take into consideration the uh, sequence of uh, terms in the document, we just say that this document contains these terms. So that's why this is a bag of words. Um, and we can kind of think about this a little bit, that we have like a huge, huge, huge uh, vector. Uh, and this, the length of the vector is the number of unique terms that you have in your corpus. So for the English language, you have probably hundreds of thousands of unique elements in this, uh, this, um, this vector. But only a few of them are actually non-zero, right? The words that are in or the terms that are inside this document. So that's why we call it a sparse vector, because there's only very few uh, number of these, uh, these elements that are actually non-zero. Of course, we don't represent them as a long vector. We represent them using some other more uh, kind of uh, structure that's more uh, applicable to that. However, we can think about it like a very sparse, sparse vector. And we put this into uh, an a index, inverted index, so we can kind of look up these terms later. So when a query comes in, we do the same thing. We, we represent them using this bag of words. And then we look up each of these terms, which documents contain these words. We get a set of documents that are in some way relevant to the query. And then we score them using some scoring function, typically these days, of course, or typically over many, many different uh, years, is a BM25 scoring function. <coughs> It looks kind of complicated. Uh, it's not really, uh, but it's structured in a way that we can pre-compute a lot of stuff. And instead of just saying which words are within which uh, document, we can actually weight these terms a little bit and store that. And so I'm going to use that at some later in some time. <coughs> And this is kind of like the state of search over many, uh, over many, many years. Um, but it's kind of prone to one thing that's called a vocabulary uh, mismatch. And that's basically if you're kind of searching for something that's not exactly what, uh, what's inside of your uh, documents, it, you might miss the relevant documents that you have. And then we have a lot of tricks that you can use in, in BM25 or, or within term-based uh, uh, retrieval, like different types of pre-processing, stemming, lemmatization, stop word removal, and so on. Many different types of tricks that you can use to increase recall. <coughs> And the term is sparse retrieval, I mean, uh, or sparse representations. It's not something that was very commonly used uh, before. It's mostly something that's been more uh, used now recently to connect it with a dense retrieval, which I'll get back to in a, in a little bit. <coughs> So just as a kind of short example, uh, we have the documents containing different terms. Uh, we have the sparse representation on top there. We can create an in inverted index. And the inverted index contains what's called the posting lists of each document within these different terms. We can uh, issue some sort of query. We can look at which terms connect to which uh, documents and thus get a set of relevant documents. And then we can use different scoring functions, of course, to be able to score how relevant these documents are for the query. So very uh, straightforward. Uh, that's the way we do kind of sparse, sparse retrieval. <coughs> um, of course, um, many terms or words inside these documents uh, occur with different frequencies and so on. Some are very common, some are very, you know, not common and so on. Uh, but there's different ways of accelerating this. So or queries that contain a lot of common words uh, would pretty much have to scan through entire document collection to be able to you know, score all these documents. Um, there's different ways of accelerating this. One is wand. I won't get too much into that, but it's basically a way of, of, saying, of skipping through many, many documents by looking at how much a term can actually contribute to the score. And it kind of keeps a set of relevant documents and you know, tries to spin through that. I'm not going to talk too much about that. I'm just going to mention here here for, I'm going to bring it up a little bit later, is that there are ways to accelerate uh, a sparse retrieval rather than just kind of uh, skimming through the entire document collection. Okay, that was the kind of like the state up to about, I don't know, 10, 12 something years ago. Uh, and then uh, in came the er era of uh, deep learning. Uh, we had this uh, a word to vec and everything started looking uh, interesting and so on. And about three years ago, of course, we, uh, in came uh, BERT and transformers and so on and kind of changed the landscape a little bit. You probably know the story there. Uh, and one of the kind of first usages of these, uh, these models within uh, search uh, was uh, what's called cross-encoding. And basically, it was taking uh, the your document collection or whatever kind of 
content that you have, the words and so on, and then breaking down into tokens and different transformer models. You use different forms of tokenization. You have byte per encoding, you have word piece, sentence piece, and so on. But they all kind of take the words and they break them down into individual tokens. <laughs> So we have a kind of a sequence of tokens. Uh, and you can do that the same with a query. Uh, break that down into a set of, uh, or a sequence of tokens. And you can kind of put those two into the, mo into the transformer model and out uh, you can calculate how uh, relevant the query is for the document and so on. So more concretely, we have something that looks like this. Uh, a cross encoder works like this, that you have a query up on, the to uh, up on the top there, and you have some sort of separator token. You have the CLS token, which is kind of the start of, of whatever you want to calculate. You have uh, the, the sequence of tokens of the query, and the separator, and the sequence of tokens for uh, a document. <coughs> and each of these tokens have their own vector representation. Uh, and this, each of these vector representations are kind of just sent through this huge, huge uh, transformer model typically containing hundreds of millions of, uh, of parameters. And then you get another sequence of these kind of vectors uh, on the other side. And then it's typically uh, common to look at this one token, the CLS token, classification token, whatever you want to call it, and run some sort of softmax on the other side and see, and be able to calculate what is the probability that sentence one matches sentence two. Now you, you do this in like having a, 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 um, a data set, for instance, MS Marco, that you want to kind of fine tune it on. So you send in what the queries in the documents and, uh, and with, uh, if you know that the query is, is relevant or the document is relevant to the query, that's a signal for back propagating all this through, through the transformer model and so on. And thus uh, getting new uh, representations for each token and so on. Of course, this, this, has, this has some drawbacks uh, because there's no way of indexing this, right? Because you need to take the query and each and every document that you have in your collection and you, you have to kind of calculate this for every document. And this, of course, takes a while because this is a kind of big, big uh, model uh, and it's not really a feasible uh, way of doing this. So, uh, it can work uh, if you have a smaller document collection, which means that you can do, like, for instance, BM25 or this traditional uh, search of BM25 first and do a re ranking with this. this. is a common way of doing it, and it works actually very well. And that's a uh, pretty good way of doing it these days. <coughs> However, there's another way as well, which became popular a little bit later, or pretty much the same time, just afterwards, uh, which is called the bi-encoder. So just kind of uh, differentiate between what a cross-encoder is and a bi-encoder. The bi-encoder has two different transformer models rather than just one. Well, they don't have to be different, but it's like two at least. And you have one for the query and one for the document. Uh, works the same way. Uh, and on the other side, uh, you have this signal uh, for instance, dot product of Euclidean or close and whatever you want to use about how relevant the query is to, to the document or oppositely. And you train this uh, and you back, back propagate this uh, through the two different uh, models. And the uh, kind of nice property of this is that the documents, of course, they, can, they only need to be calculated like during indexing, not during a query time. So you can actually spend some time on that if you want to. Uh, and the query transformer needs to be done during a query, uh, so, may, uh, so, uh, uh, so it needs to be calculated during a query. But um, the benefit here is that a transformer model uh, typically has this process called self-attention. And self-attention means that each and every token is aware of each and every token. So the runtime of a transformer model is quadratic to the length of sequence that you have. Uh, so the query transformer, the queries typically are shorter than documents. So running the query is actually, or transforming the query is actually, or can be uh, fairly efficient. So you do have actually time to do that. Also, you can have a different model for the queries and the documents. Uh, so they can be made more efficient. So that's the way we do it these days. And these documents or these vectors that come from the documents there, they can be stored inside of a nearest neighbor retrieval uh, system. So this is how uh, embedded or dense retrieval looks. You still have your documents, you have your processing, which is the same tokenization as before, and you transform to uh, embedding representations. And now instead of these kind of sparse representations, we have a short, shorter, dense representation. Uh, short here is like in the order of you know, a few hundred elements, uh, typically for BERT-based transformers, 768 dimensions, uh, and so on. And these are stored inside of your nearest neighbor um, uh, search engine or database. 
And the same with the query. We kind of calculate the embedding there, and then we have the embedding of the query, and we can kind of look for the nearest neighbor of uh, this uh, query within some sort of, you know, within the document collection, and hopefully, you know, find the documents that are closest to the query. Okay, that's how we, that's the kind of idea behind the dense, uh, dense retrieval. <clears throat> so you can s kind of think about dense representations as like some sort of way of compressing the huge kind of sparse representation of of, uh, of a document or a query down to a much shorter uh, dense representation. And we can use various types of different uh, scoring models. Uh, the most commonly used one today is dot product, but you have all also other options, Euclidean and cosine, depending on you know the model that you're using. Um, Dot product or inner product is the most common one, but it has some issues regarding indexing and at least real time indexing and so on because it needs to be normalized and so on. But that's, that's another talk. Um, one of the nice things about um, dense representations, uh, of course, is that you can really represent anything. It's not necessarily just text. You can uh, represent text, images, sounds, uh, user profiles, uh, purchase sequences, whatever, as this kind of just sequence of, of numbers. Uh, so it enables kind of like um, a multimodal uh, search as well. So you can pretty much train these using uh, train these for so you can you know connect or have semantic representation of text with images, so you can easily create kind of uh, image search uh, applications as well. So basically, you're just projecting this uh, image and this text representing the image into kind of some same uh, semantic space. But at least this dense representation allow you or enable you to do these kinds of interesting, interesting things. So when you have like a, a dense um, representation of something, uh, you can kind of think about this uh, having documents in some sort of high dimensional space, and you have a query, you know, in this uh, high dimensional space as well. And what you want to do is you want to find the closest documents to that query using various kind of distance functions that you have available. Um, problem is with that approach is that there's kind of no known way of doing that exactly uh, for uh, for uh, nearest neighbor search without um, uh, going down to a kind of a linear scan of all documents. So the only way of doing that is building index structures around that, and they are approximate. So we can only find approximately the nearest neighbors using various you know uh, solutions. There are a few ways of doing that that can that can be built upon traditional inverse indexes. You know, using kind of k-means approach, uh, product quantization and its relatives, uh, locality-sensitive hashing, and so on. And it's basically about you know indexing the uh, clusters or centroids of the clusters in some sort of inverse index. Uh, but uh, these days, mostly uh, one uses, um, I think most approaches that use ANNs for, for this, these kinds of uh, applications use the HNSW or the hierarchical navigable small world, which is a graph based structure, which is not really compatible with inverse indexes. So you need like your own uh, system for that. And it has a lot of uh, benefits as, as well, which, but that is also another talk. <coughs> okay. Um, so, kind of comparing these two approaches to each other, uh, this is the kind of leaderboard from from the um, sentence Bert uh, net page. Um, uh, brilliant library, uh, easily used to or easily. Uh, use this sentence bird library to create uh, embeddings both for documents and queries and so on. And it has like this, this, uh, this leaderboard here. And as we see here before the MS Marco uh, data set, the BM25 using Elasticsearch has a mean reciprocal rank score of about 17 or 17.3. Uh, That's kind of the baseline. Uh, however, using these other approaches, uh, different forms of, of uh, ways of encoding uh, this dense representations, you see they're much, much better. Uh, 34.4, 33.7 for these different types of models uh, for cosine similarity or, or dot product and so on. So, I mean, at the uh, just looking at this, it looks that really there's no contest between these, right? I mean, BM25 is outdated, all this, uh, these new ways of representing and using those re dense representations much, much better. So we should, you know, just use that, right? Um, 
but not entirely, right? Because um, first of all, BM25 is an unsupervised method. It's basically no training. It's basically very easy to use that for document collection. There's there's just no way, no training, no things that you need to to fine tune or whatever. However, these other models here for dense uh, dense representations, they really need to be trained towards this data set, and these have been trained towards MS Marco uh, um, specifically to work well uh, for MS Marco. Of course, that's, there's no contest in that direction. <coughs> However, there are, if we kind of open up a little bit, uh, there are nuances here. Um, and this is from the, the original DPR paper, and I think it's an example that's really kind of showing, uh, telling of the kind of differences between a, a kind of a sparse or term-based thing like BM25 versus a kind of a dense representational way of doing it. So for example, uh, if your question is, or the query, uh, what is the body of water between England and Ireland? If we do a BM25 uh, search, then we get something, maybe get something like this uh, around British cycling, because it contains the words or terms England and body and Ireland and so on. And just using term-based bag of word scoring, it seems like that's a pretty relevant document to the query. But of course, it's not, uh, not really uh, relevant at all. However, this dense uh, representation is able to find the correct or most relevant document that, co that contains around the Irish Sea. Because this is kind of a more semantic representation that kind of understands that the body of water means something like sea. Right? So it's like a, a, a softer connection between what's, what's actually uh, uh, quoted here. But also, oppositely, who plays Thoros of Mute in Game of Thrones? It's a very specific query, right? So you're actually asking for something that's very specific so, uh, words in this, uh, this, uh, this document. And here, the BN25 is able to you know, retrieve the correct document uh, and the, the, of Paul K, which is the uh, uh, answer to that question, because it specifically contains the words Game of Thrones and Thoros of Mute. But uh, dense passage, this is the DPR, dense passage retrieval model, is not able to see that at all. It's not, been, it's not within the training uh, set. So <clears throat> there are kind of, it's, it's not worth just throwing away the BM25 uh, quite yet, because it might contain some sort of benefits in, in using that as well. And uh, another aspect is uh, what happens when you take a look at um, uh, tasks or uh, other um, other uh, data sets that are out of domain from what you're training. So what we saw earlier was this: uh, these dense representations that work very well uh, within the context of MS Marco that we're trained against, but they don't very work. Oh, don't work that well on domains that are not. Uh, so uh, this. Uh, uh, this uh, beer, the paper that came out about, uh, I think, yeah, last year, uh, specifically kind of wants to uh, open that up a little bit and uh, measure this. And they came up with uh, nine, no, uh, 18 data sets and nine different tasks of kind of out of domain uh, data sets to be able to kind of measure this in some way so to see how well do these test representations work outside of their kind of uh, competence zone. And um, out of domain, what, what I mean by that is that there's kind of different types of why something is out of domain. Something is that documents are different. It's an entirely different type of documents. It's like uh, a medical text versus text about cars and so on. That's, that's different uh, documents. Uh, queries are different. The, the you know, actual queries that you use query towards the document set. And the query document relationship can be different. Like sometimes you're just asking for something very specific. Sometimes you're asking uh, questions and so on. So, and, and of course, all of the above. And what this original beer paper found was that BM25 is actually a pretty decent baseline for most things, right? So what we can see here is that this, this line in the middle here, it's like how well BM25 scores across these uh, 18 different uh, data sets. And B the baseline BM25 is better than, you know, six out of these nine different uh, models or approaches. Uh, across, on average, across all these different data sets. The one that works best is this BM25 uh, first phase with the cross encoder uh, and the second stage. Right? So this is kind of multi-stage uh, uh, retrieval. So uh, initially, it doesn't look very well that this, these kind of dense, dense uh, representations, they don't really generalize that well outside of uh, whatever they've been trained on. It seems like. But since then, 
we've seen that BM25 has some sort of you know, properties that work well on some sort of documents, and we see that this denser tree works also very well on some uh, different uh, um, types of documents as well. It's very easy to think, well, let's try to combine this in a way, see if we can kind of get some of the nice properties of, of BM25 and some of the nice properties of this dense retrieval, maybe kind of you know, use both of them and try to see if we can you know, extract even better um, results at the end. So uh, if we kind of set that up, we have like a, a hybrid retrieval here where we do term-based uh, retrieval on one side and we do embedded or dense-based retrieval on the other side and we combine these results in some way, what can we get out of that? Um, there are different ways of combining this. I'm going to show just two different ways of, of doing this because it's the two easiest way of doing it. Uh, one is that, so let's say that we have these results coming from, from the sparse uh, set. Uh, and these coming from the dense uh, retrieval, then we have uh, the kind of naive way of thinking about this. We have some linear combination, saying that we have the kind of the scores of these different documents given a, a sparse query, and the scores of, of these given the dense query, and we can combine them in some way. And uh, note that these kind of have different, you know, uh, score averages and, and so on that might come from different distributions of scores in some way, so we need to be able to combine them efficiently anyway. So the easiest way is to kind of have some sort of linear combination, just selecting some sort of you know alpha here, which is just a, how much do you want the, the final result set to be weighted towards BM25, or how much do you want to be weighted towards, towards dense. So here, for instance, if we have an alpha of 0 0.5, we would get this kind of ordering from these documents. And then we have the alternative called reciprocal rank fusion, which is a parameter less way of doing it. And it just kind of, you know, don't care about the scores at all. We just look at the ordering. And uh, that's basically this, this, uh, this function here. And it's basically saying that, okay, if, if a document is highly ordered in both of these, then it will get a high order in, in the resulting and so on. So we're not really caring about scores at all. We're looking at the ordering inside of these different, uh, different results. It actually works very well. So um, we set this up uh, within Vespa. Just kind of very few words about how we kind of set this up. Um, Vespa is uh, the, um, a, a platform for doing many different things, but in this case, a search. Uh, in Vespa, you set up this application package, which is kind of a declarative application package that is saying how you want to do something, like how you want to set up search and how you want to score these documents, how you want to, if you want these and these machine learning models in there, if you want these, this custom code, and so on. Uh, you write this application package, it gets sent to this uh, config cluster, and it's distributed across all the different nodes that you have in your system. And then this, the two kind of main system, main types of nodes that we have in Vespa, is uh, the stateless container nodes, which is basically where you run your own uh, personal or uh, custom code. And then we have content nodes where all the content is stored. So whenever some sort of HTTP request comes in for a query, it gets sent to one of the uh, stateless container nodes where you're able to run machine learning models for like embedding uh, the query. And then it's sent to uh, all the content nodes where we kind of do a, a retrieval uh, for, um, for the, the most relevant documents. It gets sent back into the stateless this container and, and back again. So I'll just kind of give you an idea how that, uh, that works. Um, setting this up inside of Vespa, uh, having these two different ways of doing it, like BM25 on the one hand, and uh, uh, this embedding dense retrieval on the other side is very, very easy uh, these days, after some development work on our side. Uh, and basically, this is kind of an example of a schema for a document that does both. So in this case, we have a document uh, which is in a, a content uh, field, which just says enable BM25, means it builds up a BM25 index for that. And then we have another field called embedding, which basically says, gives it some kind of uh, um, instructions that during index, we should take the content field, which is up here, and we should embed it using a some sort of embedder which you set up some, uh, somewhere else, embed transformer, and it will create automatically for you an embedding, and that is actually what will be stored inside of the index. In this case, we want to uh, store this inside of an HNSW index, and we want inner product to be uh, the distance metric. And with that, we have uh, actually enabled both of these types of, of, uh, of retrieval, both BM25 and dense. And uh, Vespa will also take care of actually embedding this uh, for you. We have some instructions on how to do that down here, but yeah. And this is an example of how we would do a linear uh, ranking, basically saying, okay, 
we would do 0 0.5 times the BM25 score plus 0 0.5 times the kind of embedding uh, or the dense retrieval score. It's called closeness in this in this uh, this instance. Um, the uh, reciprocal rank fusion is basically custom code, and that needs to be done on the outside of this, this stateless uh, container nodes that we saw, because basically we can't do that on one in one document. We have to kind of look at two different document streams. So we need to kind of lift that up a little bit, but I'm not going to show that, uh, let's say. But the results. Um, out of domain results. This first graph here on the left down here, it's not actually out of domain, it's actually in domain, but it's, it's kind of just want to show that as well to kind of get some sort of impression here. So this blue line here is the, the, the kind of resulting set of doing a linear combination of, of um, BM25 and um, this uh, uh, dense retrieval. We're using sentence transformers in this case, mini LM uh, model. And we see here, if we have a alpha of zero, meaning this is only the dense side, we're only using dense, we have a kind of a, a recall of 1,000 around 94 or something. And if we're only using uh, BM25, we have a lower score over here. So in this case, it kind of mirrors what we already saw, and that dense works better because it's in domain. <coughs> However, interestingly, there's some, there's, it actually benefits a little bit from using uh, BM25, at least in the beginning with the small values of, of alpha in this case. So, so actually, the, the results are better if we kind of are able to combine them in, in some ways. This red line here is using reciprocal rank fusion, and it's, it's of course, uh, even better. It's just a straight line because it's don't really have this alpha alpha value, and it works very well. And it's so this uh, combining these two in domain uh, works better than each of them individually. This uh, yellow line <coughs> is kind of just uh, fun to, to see. It's a, it's the same as if you're using uh, two. Um, uh, if you're using BM25 in the first stage and you're using a cross encoder in the second stage, but then instead of using actual cross encoder score, only that in this, in this, as a score in the second phase, you're combining BM25 and that score as a value of the second phase. And you see that there, it's, it's actually no benefit of doing that uh, at all. It's mostly better to just use the cross encoder score uh, uh, at all, because uh, it turns out that the cross encoder pretty much encodes all the information that's in the BM25. So it's actually not beneficial to combine them anyway. I think that's kind of interesting result. So uh, these other two graphs here, uh, Robust04 and Trek COVID, both of them are from, from uh, the beer data set. Robust04 is a, as a uh, data set that's pretty close to MS Marco, not really that, that different. Um, and so you have, um, but still you have see here that the dense uh, retrieval on this side is lower than BM25. So BM25 works better than, than dense retrieval on this side. But still, if you're able to combine them a little bit, you still get kind of a, a boost over here, and this uh, reciprocal rank fusion works much better than both of them. Okay. <clears throat> Trick COVID on this other side is a, another data set that has you know pretty much a big uh, shift in and uh, in uh, it's a pretty big domain shift outside of MS Marco, and of course being Trek COVID is much more about medical text and so on, and contains a lot of words and, and, and content that's pretty much outside of what MS Marco contains. And you see here the difference between the BM25 on this side and the dense retrieval on this side is much much larger. So, uh, so BM25 in this case works better across uh, this, this out of domain uh, data set. And of course, it's, it's unsupervised method, and that's why BM25 is a pretty good uh, baseline uh, for most of the things that you do. But even then, even if you have a dense retrieval method that's you know, trained on something else, it's still beneficial to be able to combine them in some ways when you have this reciprocal rank fusion. Right? So, kind of interesting results, right? So, even though your dense retrieval uh, method is out of domain. Uh, it still is beneficial when you combine it with uh, with uh, with uh, BM25. So they're kind of working uh, better than than both of them individually. Interesting result. <coughs> Of course, now we just talked about BM25 on one side, and we talked about kind of dense representation on the other side. So this kind of setup here is from, from the paper from by Jimmy Lin called the Proposed Conceptual Framework for Representational Approach to Information uh, Retrieval. Kind of a long, uh, long name. But still, it's kind of uh, interesting to, he, he's kind of uh, set this up a little bit to be able to kind of s 
more properly uh, combine this or uh, uh, see where these different approaches are at. So we've been looking at the sparse bag of words uh, method, which is an unsupervised method, which is in this corner here. And the approach that we, com uh, that we uh, compared it with was a dense supervised uh, side down here. Uh, but of course, there are other ways of thinking about this as well. There are other uh, kind of uh, uh, methods of doing this. And the one interesting kind of area is over here, where we still have a sparse representation of things, uh, not beyond 25, but uh, we've learned a way of uh, indexing these, um, these uh, different terms. Uh, and basically, it's about learning, uh, learning term weights and document expansions. So basically, uh, these different approaches here uses some sort of BERT model or transformer model uh, to learn uh, vector representations uh, or sparse representations for these different terms and use different techniques, kind of similar to what we did with BM25 to increase uh, recall, uh, so, such as you know, document expansion and so on. And if we take a kind of look at that, they actually perform fairly well uh, within um, well, I don't know if you can see that, but this is the, the, the table that comes from this paper, uh, and that uh, they work fairly well in domain, but it turns out, which is not, you can't see here, these kind of uh, methods here that uses this sparse bag words method, they also tend to uh, work fairly well also uh, out of domain, uh, which also BM25 does as well, better than dense vectors alone. Uh, but some approaches, such as the Colbert uh, V2 and anyone called Unifier, which uh, kind of, uh, is a kind of new direction which tries to kind of train both a sparse and a dense representation inside of the model itself. Uh, and it's kind of like spanning these two different things. And uh, the Colbert V2 is a model, at least, that I know of that uh, is, is working very well across different domains. And basically, this is all about representation and learning. <laughs> So, um, finally, uh, just kind of sum this up a little bit. Uh, BM25 and dense retrieval is what we saw there, complementary, right? Because they have different aspects, they have different qualities that can be used with each other and be able to kind of play off each other and, and together form something that might be uh, even better. Uh, but this is just really ensemble learning, right? Within machine learning, uh, we have this concept of ensemble learning where you have different uh, kind of methods or different weak learners that we call, and they can combine later uh, to be like a better, a strong learner, what's it called? So you have different sorts of, of, of approaches uh, there and you can combine them in different ways. And yeah, this is pretty much just an ensemble, right? Because now we just look at BM25 and, and dense, but you can think about having you know, many other uh, forms of retrieval and combine them, for instance, using this reciprocal rank fusion and get even better results. Maybe, I don't know, that's a uh, question. Uh, but there are other ways of thinking about this because we just used this reciprocal rank fusion, which was a parameterless way of, uh, of combining these results, works very well. Uh, but there are other ways as well. Uh, for instance, um, we saw that this BM25 uh, example worked very well because it was very specific things that we were looking at, this Doris of Mirror example. Uh, so we can envision that maybe you have some sort of ensemble that's like, okay, we have a query coming in for something very specific, the IDF scores are high, so maybe we can kind of weight it a little bit towards the BM25 retrieval, uh, or we can see the terms are very kind of spe uh, not very specific, maybe we can weight it a little bit towards the dense retrieval method, or we can maybe even train this using a machine learning model and, and, you know, uh, and do that instead. So there's many different options going forward. Uh, of course, uh, all of this is very easy to set up in Vespa, so take a message, uh, Vespa is awesome. So. That was pretty much everything I was going to say. Mm. Mm. Questions? Uh, thank you. So I have, um, I have a simple question. Let's say you're not starting by using Vespa and you're interested in blending sparse and dense uh, based search methods. Like it, do you have to move first to something like Vespa for both dense and sparse, or can you imagine like combining by having the elastic search or solar or whatever part for the sparse part and then starting at least at the starting point for a POC using something like Vespa or something else for the dense part and mm. then combining those together yeah um 
Of course, I mean, it's up to you. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm most familiar with Vespa. I work with Vespa, of course, Ali. I want to for say that this is really easy to set up Vespa, but there's nothing wrong with uh, setting up your, like your one kind of uh, system using Elasticsearch, using Feist on the other hand, and so on, and doing it all yourself. You should get the same results. Definitely. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Um, hi. Thanks Thank for the very interesting talk. Um, I have a question regarding this hybrid approach. Have you seen um, uh, any places that combined even more solutions and ensembling them together? So, for example, having a classic retrieval like BM25, having dense contextual semantic retrieval, and then also something like historical data or even manual ranking methods or something like that? Uh, I haven't personally. Uh, I tried to kind of allude to that in the end, that that's a real possibility, and it's definitely something you should get working on. <laughs> on it, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks for your talk. Um, I have a question around the engineering concerns of using transformers in production. So specifically around the abstraction of detail with large documents. Is there any implementations dealing with that within VESP or do you have any experience with that problem? Uh, yeah, well, of course, um, uh, it's, I mean, these, these transformers, they're not cheap, right? Uh, they're, they're, depending on the model that you use, I mean, they're different size of models and, and different so on. But the, the original kind of BERT uh, large model that a lot of people used initially is very computationally expensive, right? Uh, but there's kind of, uh, there's two different things, right? One is during uh, document ingestion, right? During f feeding of the documents to your system, you typically have better time than during a query, right? So the, the, the time spent there is not really Really, that much of a, a problem. Um, depending, of course, if you if you have a really really large collection of, uh, of documents and you need to uh, index them within like a shortest amount of time possibly. Uh, of course, then you should use other uh, use things like GPU and, and so on. But during the query, um, that's that's pretty much when things are very time sensitive because you want to deliver things with as low latency as possible. Uh, but uh, in that case, um, uh, it might suffice just to have a, a, a regular CPU uh, implementation of this model evaluation because the queries are not really that long. So even though I have a very complex transform model, it can be done within uh, a relatively tight uh, time budget. Uh, because uh, at least uh, these, this current generation of transform models, uh, the complexity of evaluating them are are um, uh, exponential in the length of the sequence that you're actually encoding, right? It's because of the self-intention thing. And queries are typically very short, so we can do that fairly effectively. So I hope that answers your question in some way. Any, any more questions right now? Thank you. Uh, yeah, really great talk. A really powerful slide, I think, where you had the, the BM25 on one side and uh, Dense on the other side and see that the combination is actually better of both. Uh, what I was wondering is, and uh, Yo also touched a, a bit on this in his talk, uh, one of the way to, to basically overcome uh, the, the out-of-the-main Dense model would be to basically find an unsupervised way to, to train it. So like I think Neil Srimas has called this this like augmented expert. Um, where essentially you just use uh, something to get like uh, a pseudo label data using a, 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 a cross encoder. And I'm thinking since you now have an unsupervised way, way to basically find better data, if you now use that to train a dense embedding model and maybe like even loop it back in, like how w would that work? Or have you tried that? Or That's a very uh, interesting question. I have not tried that, but uh, like I said, it's something you should get uh, working on. <laughs> <laughs> It's really interesting idea. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Mm. Yep. Hi, thank you. It's a very interesting talk. I have a question about the combining the BN25 um, and and uh, the dense vector with uh, the reciprocal rank fusion. Mm -hmm. What happens if your result sets from the two are entirely disjoint? Uh, it's basically a. Um, 
I, uh, I think that in that case, it would go uh, every other uh, document, right? I think that's the uh, question there. Because it's a very fixed uh, equation there. And I think it just since it just takes the ordering, it would be like, yeah, just every other. Mm. Anyone? All right, then. Thank you, Lester. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Thank you.